and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to hide this uh, camera to avoid distraction. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about um, the technology we're developing here at Fluid Analytics for measuring the affinity of challenging protein targets. Um, as Victoria said, I'm the, the head of our research and development at, uh, at Fluid Analytics. Uh, been with the company for a fair time, so hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions uh, if anybody posts them during the presentation. Uh, we won't take any questions as I'm going through the slides, but I'll deal with them all at the end, if that's okay. Okay. So just a quick outline of what uh, I'll talk about today. So I'll start by introducing microfluidic diffusional sizing, explain uh, sort of how it works and, and what its advantages are over other techniques. The bulk of the presentation will be looking at uh, particular examples of applications, so focusing on um, selective targets, in this case protein A, IgG interaction, uh, looking at multi-molecular complexes, fibrils, and aptamers, and then we'll just wrap up and hopefully have time at the end for uh, as many questions as people have. So, Sort of looking at the, the, the benefits of, of microfluidic diffusion sizing over other techniques. Um, it's a purely solution-based technique, uh, so there's no surface or matrix. Now, what this means is that we don't have any avidity effects. So, of course, avidity, avidity is the impact of having multiple interactions close together, and this is something that happens often on surfaces. But by working in solution, we avoid uh, avidity, so when we measure affinity, we're actually measuring uh, the direct in solution affinity. Of course, with, with no surface or matrix, there's also a more natural environment. So uh, for certain uh, molecules, challenging molecules, such as uh, intrinsically disordered proteins, membrane proteins, and multi-protein complexes, this is a, a, of a particular advantage. And finally, because it's in, uh, purely in solution, we know the concentration of all the species that are present. And this allows us to determine stoichiometri stoichiometries. Uh, and again, this is something that as soon as you find uh, one molecule on the surface, you lose control of the concentration that's, there, that's available there, and therefore you can no longer determine stoichiometry in a straightforward manner. Uh, being microfluidic, it is a low volume technique, so it only requires five microliters to take a measurement. And importantly, it's easy to use. This has been one of the sort of driving forces for us during the development of our product. Uh, is making sure that it's really very easy to use, and I've had uh, my, my young children using it without any problem at all. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, allow a, a short video to play now. It's about one and a half minutes long. Uh, it will explain how the technology, the underlying technology works, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue after that, and I'll be quiet while we, we listen to the audio on the video. In the Fluidity 1W, a stream of fluorescently labelled protein is introduced into the diffusion chamber alongside an auxiliary stream. These streams flow in parallel with no convective mixing. So the only way protein can migrate from one stream to the other is by diffusion. Small peptides and proteins diffuse rapidly, large proteins and aggregates slowly. At the end of the diffusion chamber, the streams are split. The quantity of protein in each stream is determined by the fluorescence from the label. The ratio of fluorescence between the two streams gives us the protein's hydrodynamic radius. The Fluidity 1W can measure this with proteins in buffer and in crude solutions like cell lysates or biological fluids because only the labelled species is detected. If we repeat the test using a mixture of labelled protein and unlabeled binding partner, we can observe the degree of binding due to the change in size. Only species including the labeled protein are detected and measured. Titrating the binding partner against the labeled protein gives a binding curve and automatically generates a KD value on screen. The hydrodynamic radius for the unbound protein and the protein complex are also automatically calculated and displayed. Okay, so hopefully we're back uh, back live now. Um, so, so the um, 
the video there just described how it works. So we look at the interactions by measuring the size of the labeled species, and then we can titrate in and bind to uh, our binding partners, and that will increase, obviously, the size of that labeled species. And then we measure that new size. Uh, and by doing this across a series of concentrations, we get uh, the, the titration for the KD. So just very quickly, uh, go here. So the, the instrument that we are uh, looking at right now is the so-called Fluidity 1W. Uh, so this, as, as mentioned in the video, measures change in protein size. Uh, it can work for protein-protein, protein-lipid, or protein-DNA interactions. And importantly, it also works in crude backgrounds because of this uh, the pre-labeling of the protein of interest and thereby um, not being able to see what's happening in the background. So you can see the instrument itself on the left-hand side here. Uh, it's a, there's a benchtop reader and then it's a microfluidic chip. There's this uh, small black uh, piece of plastic in the mouthpiece of the instrument. Uh, and it has no external computer, so it's got the onboard touchscreen there for control and, and uh, reporting of data. Okay, so now just to, to run through a few application examples. So I sort of characterized these in a few different groups, so the importance of absolute size, uh, looking at challenging samples, and finally um, an example with a non-protein uh, binder. So the first example I'm going to talk about today is Protein A binding to IgG. So protein A is something that's probably familiar to uh, many of my listeners today. Uh, it binds to IgG and is used widely in the purification of antibodies. Uh, it actually binds combined IgG. So in this uh, left-hand image here, we have an antibody and the two binding sites uh, for protein A are indicated on the antibody there. So combined on the SC domain, on the, the this, this bottom bit here, as shown in the crystal structure in green, with the, the protein A structure shown in, in pink. Uh, and it can also bind to the FAB domain, uh, as shown on the right-hand side with the blue um, FAB domain structure. Protein A itself is a, um, it cont contains five binding domains. So I've sort of added a, uh, a depiction, a schematic depiction at the bottom of the screen here of showing the five binding domains for antibodies each of which is made up of three helices, as shown by the red uh, bars down the bottom. Uh, the peptide itself also has a, an extended C-terminal tail, but in the, the standard recombinant proteins, uh, this is typically chopped off. So we took this just as a simple model system to have a look at the interaction between protein A and IgG, and we did this in uh, two matrices. We had a simple matrix, just PBS tween, and a complex matrix of uh, freestyle 293 cell culture medium. So uh, comparing the results we obtained from both of those, we see uh, extremely similar outputs. So again, what we're looking at here is we have the protein A has been fluorescently labeled, and then we're titrating in uh, a particular IgG, in this case it was an anti-EGFR antibody. Uh, so the key points to take away from this is that we get at very low concentrations of added binder of, of, of the antibody, we get essentially a, a quality control measure on our label species. So as shown here on the right-hand side, uh, we see a hydrodynamic radius of 4.7 nanometers. And this is uh, something we'll come back to in a minute. <clears throat> then we perform our titration, and at some point it reaches a plateau, a saturation plateau, and we get uh, some interesting information there about the size of the final complex that we're measuring. So in this case, it's uh, on the order of 11.5 nanometers. And finally, obviously, the thing we came looking for was the KDs, and so we can see we've got the KD values there, uh, agreeing extremely well despite these two very different media, and also in turn agreeing with uh, what you would expect based on literature reports, uh, which are on the order of, of tens of nanomolar. So, we, we thought this was pretty interesting, but then we actually wanted to go and dig a little bit deeper into these, uh, these, these hydrodynamic radii that we measured, because this is one of the key outputs from the instrument, is that we're measuring absolute sizes. We're not measuring a, a proportion bound or anything. We're actually measuring the, the actual size of these molecules. So we decided to take a look at the, at the structures. Let me skip the slide there. Okay. So if we look at the structure of, of protein A, uh, 
most of the structures in the PDB um, are single domains. So as I mentioned, there's this three helix domains. <clears throat> there is one structure of two domains, as shown here in this sort of pink uh, die domain structure here. Uh, and so we decided, okay, well, let's have a think about this. If we expand that two domain structure up and replicate it to make a, a five domain structure that would reflect the, the recombinant protein that we were using, how large would we expect that to be? And then, because this looks very compact and we're looking at a, a fairly small protein, protein A is about 40 kilodaltons, binding to potentially multiple antibodies uh, of 150 kilodaltons each, we thought the other likelihood or the other possibility is that we're looking at a crystal artifact here and in fact the structure and solution is extended uh, as shown in the top here. And so that, that structure was also generated. Both of them were subjected to energy minimization and then the uh, size was predicted using HydroPro. And we compared that to the measurements we got. So we can see here in this chart, the size, predicted size for the compact structure. This is the bottom structure here. And the extended structure uh, as shown on the top. And the experimental value that we see corresponds very closely to the prediction based on the extended value. So that suggests that in solution, protein A uh, adopts this extended conformation rather than the, com the compact configuration that we might expect based on the crystal structure. Uh, the obvious next step was to take that then and apply the same sort of uh, thinking to the, um, the, the protein bound structure with the, the antibodies bound. So we again generated models starting from this extended conformation for either one, two, or three antibodies bound. Uh, it was essentially sterically impossible to fit the, the remaining remaining two sites with antibodies, and predict the size of the, the size, sorry, of these species, and that's shown in the plot here. Uh, and as you can see from this, we get a good agreement between the final size, this is the 11 and a half nanometers measured using the fluidity 1W, and the size that we would predict for uh, binding three uh, antibodies. And interestingly, this actually corresponds quite well with uh, reports from the literature where researchers use chromatographic techniques to characterize the binding capacity of IgG, of, of uh, protein A for IgG, sorry, and found that it was uh, between two and three, close to three. So just to summarize that uh, brief study, um, microfluidic diffusional sizing allowed us to determine the affinity between protein A and IgG in both simple and complex matrices. Uh, the affinities were the same in both, uh, both buffers, and the sizes were also the same. So this tells us that there's no impact of the change in buffer on the structure or function of IgG, uh, of, oh, sorry, protein A or IgG uh, in this case. Uh, and um, interestingly, we saw that solution, in solution, protein A adopts an extended conformation, so there's no uh, conformational change on binding IgG that we could, we could detect, uh, because that's, that same structure is maintained on binding IgG. Okay, so now we'll turn uh, to some multi-protein complexes. So this is a, just a, a very quick one-slide example first before I step into one that's slightly more, uh, even more complex. So this is a study we did in collaboration with a, a local research group that's uh, ongoing, so unfortunately I'm not able, able to uh, divulge all the details. But what we're looking at here is uh, the binding of a fluorescently labeled peptide, uh, so a, a small peptide, so two nanometers, um, binding to a, a very large intracellular um, cytoskeletal complex. So you can see here the final size is 23 nanometers. So this corresponds to about eight megadaltons, or if we think about um, specific species, that's about the size of the E. coli ribosome. So it's a really large complex with several proteins in it. Uh, we can see we obtained from this uh, a KD, and again, a low nanomolar KD, uh, and in this case, it's cooperative binding. What I think is really uh, nice about this is that this, this absolute sizing allows us to confirm that the peptide is binding to the intact complex rather than some uh, smaller fragment of it, which is again a technique, a, 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 a result you wouldn't be able to uh, have be, be sure of if you are using surface-based technique. 
Okay, now I'm going to turn to a, a particularly challenging example. So this is looking at uh, measuring binding between uh, antibodies and alpha synuclein. So alpha synuclein is the protein that's the causative agent of Parkinson's disease. So it's a, a, an area of hot research these days. On the left hand side here, you can see uh, an image of a, a brain section from a Parkinson's patient. This large black uh, circle is a Lewy body that has been stained positively for alpha synuclein. So this is this is uh, the kind of alpha synuclein causing the disease in this patient. Um, just for anybody who's not sort of already familiar with anti uh, with uh, fibril amyloid fibrils, I've got a little schematic on the right hand side here to explain roughly what, 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 what happens here. So essentially proteins ideally exist in their folded state on the top left hand corner here. Uh, but when they're subjected to environmental stress, and some proteins are, are more prone to it than others, they can unfold. When they're unfolded, they can either collapse back into the folded state, but there's also some chance that they uh, continue to unfold and can adopt uh, um, a prefibrillar, what's called a prefibrillar assembly. So this is a beta sheet rich structure, which is able to template its own formation. So essentially this species catalyzes conversion of the folded protein into more fibril beta sheet folded proteins. So this grows uh, continually and forms these large, ordered and incredibly stable uh, amyloid fibrils, which can then go on to fragment and you get uh, various, various nucleation processes. Uh, but it is, it is thought that the, the formation of these fibrils or perhaps these, these early oligomeric states are the toxic species that lead to the, to the neurodegenerative damage seen in, for example, Parkinson's. So obviously, with, with Alzheimer's as well being a fibrillar uh, amyloid disease, uh, there's an area of, of hot research these days, and so we wanted to see if there's anything we could do in this space. So we got hold of four antibodies. Uh, these were all commercial antibodies um, that were sold as being um, specific binders to amyloid fibrils. And we decided to look at the binding of those antibodies against fibrils and monomeric uh, alpha synuclein. So we started by doing the alpha synuclein, start with the easy thing first. We started with the soluble species. Uh, and so in this case, we see a wide variation of, um, of affinities from sub-nanomolar through to uh, high nanomolar, 700 nanomolar here. And then just all the curves shown on the left-hand side. We then uh, took those same antibodies and measured their uh, affinity binding to Fibrils. So here we see a quite a different picture. Uh, only one of the antibodies actually gave a nice uh, titration curve as, as you would normally expect. And this is this MJFR1, and it allowed us to determine a KD in the fairly high nanomolar. So if you recall on the, on the previous slide, the, the affinity of this antibody for uh, the monomer was, was 260 picomolar. So in this case, it's a, it's a significantly weaker binder for the fibril, but uh, does bind and, and give a sort of titration we would expect. The other three antibodies seem to induce further aggregation as evidenced by this increase in size. So um, these two on, on the left hand side induce significant aggregation. Uh, it looks like uh, the, the size of the final species on, is on the order of one micron or larger um, in, in, in radius. Uh, where and so we're not able to determine a KD for that, but we can say it's greater than 10 micromolar. And in the case of 5G4 here, the red curve, um, we determine a KD of around 30 micromolar. Um, again, we can't be completely sure of that because we aren't able to perfectly define this upper upper size range, uh, size limit, but uh, it certainly looks on the order of 30 micromolar. <clears throat> So uh, just to summarize quickly that study, it's very, very challenging. So these, these uh, fibrils are incredibly difficult to work with. Um, they change while you're working with them. Um, and they're not really feasible to attach them to a surface and do studies like this. They, they'll they potentially lie down flat. And so you reduce, reduce your binding surface and so on. So uh, we were pretty happy to get any measurements at all with the fibrils, to be honest. Uh, but we were able to measure the affinities against the monomeric species of synuclein. And we saw a affinities range spanning over a 3,000-fold range. Uh, 
looking at the fibrillothionuclein, three of the four antibodies seem to induce further aggregation. So they, they do bind, uh, but they, they induce further aggregation. And one of them was, I guess, sort of classified as well behaved. Uh, and interestingly, despite being presented as being specific for fibrils, all of the antibodies showed greater affinity, significantly greater affinity for monomeric sinuclein than they did for the fibril form. Okay, now I'm going to, for my last uh, application example, uh, turn to a, an example which, which is a, a, including a species which is not protonaceous. So in this case, a, a DNA aptima. So we took for this example uh, aptimas against uh, thrombin. So these have been reported for years in the literature. They're fairly well characterized. Um, and they bind, uh, you can see here, to two different sites on thrombin. So thrombin is shown here in, in ribbon diagram. And we have TBA. It's a 15 uh, base pair long, uh, base long uh, and, uh, aptima that binds to exocyte 1 of thrombin, whereas uh, HD22, which is a, a longer aptima, 27 bases long, uh, binds to exocyte 2 on essentially the opposite, opposite surface of the molecule. Um, they have quite different affinities too, as we'll see. So here we are, we're looking at the, the binding curve. So again, we get at the low concentrations of thrombin, we have labeled aptimas, aptimas in this case. At low concentrations of thrombin, we get a size measurement of the, the aptima alone. So we can confirm here that the sizes are as we would expect. So we see the, the, uh, the TBA, the 15 residue long aptima, has a smaller size than HD22, as we would expect. Uh, then we get at the, the, the opposite side of the, the curve. On the right-hand side here, we get the complex uh, being formed, and we get the size for that. It confirms that we're binding to monomeric thrombin. So this size gap is consistent with binding monomeric thrombin. And of course, we get the KD. So for HD22, we get a KD. It's a sub nanomolar KD of half a, or 0.5, 500 uh, picomolar. And that agrees bang on with the literature value um, as shown there on screen. And for the other, the other aptima, the, the, the uh, TBA, this has a much lower affinity. So it's uh, 140 nanomolar. And in literature, the affinities measured there span a wide range between 25 and 200. And so uh, the value we see falls essentially right in the middle of that range. So in summary here, the uh, two labeled aptimas were titrated against thrombin and the, uh, the binding affinity between the aptima and thrombin was measured uh, successfully for each. And importantly, the KD values are in good, a good agreement with previously reported literature values using other techniques. And the application note for that has been published and is available uh, on our homepage, or if you'd like to get in contact with us directly, um, we'll be very happy to send that to you. Okay, so just uh, to quickly summarize uh, these applications, um, using microfluid distributional sizing, we've been able to characterize binding affinity in a series of challenging systems. So just to reiterate, this was uh, particularly the challenging systems that we looked at were the, the multi-protein complex, the cytoskeletal complex, and the fibril system. Uh, absolute size data can be used to infer stoichiometry, uh, as shown with the protein A IgG study. And as, as also shown in that study, it can help us guide the understanding of solution structures and importantly also allows us to confirm that the binding we see is to the expected target and can and, uh, give us that sort of extra error check or quality control check uh, there. Importantly, also, the technology is not restricted to studying proteins, as shown in the, the final example with the uh, antibodies, uh, sorry, the aptimus. So just going to, to use this, uh, this final slide here to look at the uh, specifications of the Fluidity 1W. Um, the size range that the instrument is able to measure is from 0.5 nanometers up to 20 nanometers. So this covers the range from 0.5 nanometers is uh, small molecules, dipeptides, that size, sort of size species, 
Uh, and as, as I mentioned previously, 20 nanometers is, is about on the order of 8 megadaltons, uh, or about the size of the E. coli ribosome. So essentially, any protein species that you find inside a cell, we can, we can measure on the instrument. Uh, it has com uh, kind of compatibility with uh, green fluorophores, so it's the 488525 uh, pair. There will be 50, FAM, GFB, Alexa 488, or equivalents. Uh, it's highly sensitive, so it can measure um, labeled species at concentrations of one nanomolar of Alexa 488. Uh, so that allows um, determination of KDs, as, as you saw in some of the examples, in the high picomolar range uh, and upwards. Importantly, being microfluidic, it uses very small sample volumes, so on the order of, well, five microliters uh, per data point, and it has a less than 10 minute readout and is extremely straightforward with the results being presented directly on screen. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. Um, very happy to take any questions, and of course, um, we would welcome anybody who wants to talk about their applications. If you'd like to, to discuss a potential application you think might be applicable, we'd be very happy to discuss that with you. Uh, if you'd rather just dive in and get straight to the demo, then we can arrange that as well. So just get in contact if, if uh, you're interested in either of those things. And hopefully we've got some questions coming through.